We have 32,000 residents without power. The number is declining as fast as possible. There are 200 trucks from all the municipalities on the ground as we speak, trying to restore the hydro. Our biggest concern is tonight we might have wind gusts over 40 kilometers an hour. Approximately they're 30, but if they get higher to 40 and 50, that's going to cause problems. Our warming centers are open, except Lawrence Heights Middle School Reception Center has been relocated to Lawrence Heights Community Center at 5 Rutland Road. East York Collegiate Institute Reception Center has been closed, and residents have been asked to go to Maddie Eckler Community Center at 953 Gerard Street East. Last night, we had approximately 450 people staying at our warming centers. That is going down dramatically. We still have 90 intersections that do not have power. Please treat these intersections as four-way stops. Toronto Community Housing has 76 units still without power. These are the single home units. All the buildings are up and running. Your garbage collection is normal. A lot of people have spoiled food. You're allowed to put your organic food in a plastic bag beside your bin. They will pick it up. The two fire stations that were down are up and running. We have 43, 43 crews on the roads right now cleaning debris. We have six crews from Ottawa, two crews from London, helping us with our forestry crews. Toronto District School Board has closed all their schools for child care. There are some safety issues involved, so they cannot open the schools for child care. At this time, I'd like to call on Anthony Haynes. the lights are on for everyone. And so our crews will, are out there uh, removing limbs and restoring power now into the neighborhoods. I've been talking about our process through the week where we started by restoring the large wires, they're done, and then restoring the medium-sized wires, and they were done, restoring the stations, and they're done. But I will tell you, even as late as this morning, we had additional stations lose power as a result of some of the wind gusts and trees continuing to fall on the lines. I'm most concerned that with these wind gusts that are expected over the next 24 hours that additional damage will be done. And as we begin to see melting uh, into tomorrow and the next day, that is likely to result in additional electrical damage that occurs as part of water and icing that will no doubt occur. And so we're in fact expecting uh, these 32,000 customers not to be the final work ahead of us. In fact, we expect to have additional damage over the next 24 and 48 hours. But all hands are on deck and we will not stop until the work is done. Happy to take questions. Uh, Anthony, yesterday you mentioned that uh, this wasn't perhaps the largest outage in the city's history, but you said this is you yeah. know, perhaps the largest storm Toronto Hydro has had to ever deal with. Can you clarify yeah. you know, what makes this the largest we've been set on outage? Is yeah. it I think what I said was I wasn't sure if this was the largest, so that I would go back and check our records. Toronto Hydro's been around for just over 100 years. Um, well, we don't have all the records, but when we look at the number of customers involved and the time that it's taken to bring those customers back, I think it's fair to say this is one of the largest in our corporate history. And so while it's, you know, I suppose an interesting fact, but the most important thing to do is get these customers back on as quick as possible. This is day six. There seems to be growing anger in uh, with regards to the pace of uh, work, communication. Some people now doubt why we didn't have emergency measures. What can you say that would satisfy them yeah. now? Well, with respect to the emergency measures, I've been clear on this since day one. Toronto has a clear protocol around that, and we measure the, the emergency based on 
the number of customers and the expected times to resolve uh, whatever outage issues we have. On Saturday night, before the storm had even completed, we declared the highest level of emergency that Toronto Hydro has. And what that did was immediately open up our emergency office and we started doing two things, rostering crews on a 724 basis and calling for help from our other sister utilities. All of those things were happening on Saturday night and so I can without hesitation tell you that the power could not have possibly come on any faster as a result of a citywide state of emergency. Toronto Hydro has been in a state of emergency as far as our operations go since Saturday night. So what you're dealing now with sort of individual homes and neighborhoods, I know the Deputy Mayor just uh, shared an emergency meeting and said one of the things to come out of that meeting is we're going to try and maybe figure out a way to let people know when their neighborhood will be you know, tended to. Uh, can that information come out at some point? People are wondering, you know, when will hydro crews visit their home and their neighborhood? Right. It's the, of course, the, I understand people's uh, desire to have certainty. Um, two things I think people will say about that. I've been giving you sense of the volumes that our call centers are seeing. Uh, at the height of the storm, 128,000 uh, calls came into our call centers. Our normal day is 3,000. Yesterday, we had about 30,000 calls come into our call center. Again, 10 times uh, there are capacity. And so I understand people's frustration to be able to get a clear uh, answer to the question, when is my power coming back on? Um, the second part of it, though, is that um, we are still in a triage level as a community when we're into these neighborhoods determining work that is ahead of us. And so it's hard to say, well, tomorrow if you can expect to see a truck outside your home because the work that's being done today may in fact take much longer than expected. And so I think it would be unfair for people to say, expect your power on tomorrow, you know, exit from where you're staying with friends, go home and the lights will be on by five o'clock. I think that would be irresponsible. So what we've been saying since day one is to assume the worst here, plan for the worst, and know that Toronto Hydro will not rest until your lights are back on. I think that still remains the message that I think uh, people should work uh, around that assumption. Especially since these are uh, working in individual homes, how often are they experiencing sort of go to a home and they find that their power has not, hasn't been switched by the home owner, so therefore they can't do any more work? Yeah, I don't have an a, a, a exact number on the standpipe issue, um, but I know that it has happened. Uh, it, they, they complete the work, to be clear. What we do in that case is we make safe, in other words, disconnect that individual home So it doesn't prevent us from doing the work uh, that we need to do. And then we make arrangements for the homeowner to have that work done, and then we uh, come back and reconnect on as soon as that work is done. So that's the process. Uh, we've had that process in place for an awful long time, and that's the process we're following now. And in the new conference with the Premier yesterday, you mentioned that because of the weather last night, there could be more power outages. Do you know if, if that was the case last night? Were there yeah, there was. I mean, we had, we had further service lines coming back down, as I mentioned, a couple of stations uh, went down this morning, frankly, on their way down here. Uh, what, the reason they went down is there were shorts that happened downstream from those stations, and so those stations are, are intended to protect the grid, and so they're, they're registering those shorts that are happening as branches are falling and triggering uh, those stations to open up uh, their switches to make safe. So, uh, so yes, the answer is uh, we continue to see outages from the storm that occurred. Are there any concerns that exist right now with people getting power restored and then cranking the heat or turning all of their appliances on and what have you? Are there any concerns regarding surges? We don't have any capacity uh, limitations on the grid. Uh, there's no need to conserve, if you will, our surge issues that, that we're experiencing. Once power is restored, uh, from our point of view, the flow of power returns to normal state, so we're not experiencing any of those problems. This morning, Toronto Hydro uh, tweeted, please refrain from engaging with working crews. Have your crews been expressed, uh, have people come forward to express anger or frustrations that no, way with them? Uh, quite the job's done. Uh, frankly, we have the media interrupting some of our workers trying to do their jobs. And so we want to keep people safe first. And so for people to be rushing out of their homes while electrical workers are working on the grid is not a, a, a safe thing to do. And then we want to work to have the work done efficiently. And so while we appreciate the settlements, uh, truly, truly appreciate them, and people are without power, and they just want to say thank you, um, it's, you know, it's really not the best thing to do. I, I, there was a young boy that came out yesterday, I think an 11-year-old boy with a box of cookies. 
and he wanted to give them to our employees who were working around down the lines. And, uh, and so these are the, this is the spirit of Torontonians that I've observed, but let me be clear, there are people that are very frustrated in the day six without power, and I understand they've lost food and the other things, but um, we are working as fast as we can. What about damage to the underground? We didn't have any underground uh, impact whatsoever from the storm, so one third of our customers uh, who were served by underground <coughs> Before I, I proceed to um, having um, Toronto Community Housing come up and speak, I, I'd like to advise people, for a damaged tree on private property, many people are calling asking, do you need a permit? No, you do not need a permit for a damaged tree only, or a tree that is split, or a tree that has fallen and you want to remove it. On a private, you've got to get a private contractor, but you do not need a permit in this situation. But I emphasize only for trees that have been destroyed, not healthy trees. You, you still have the permit process in place, but if you want to remove a tree that has come down on your property, you, you may and you do not need a, a permit, yeah. Um, there was an individual, and I know we've revisited this, um, who was declaring a state of emergency. There was an individual who was in here who was saying when there are disasters in other countries, we send an emergency disaster staff, a unit, out to help, and he's saying that people in his community are in that sort of why we don't have units, disaster emergency units out there helping. Well, again, I, I, I'm going to reemphasize this probably for the hundredth time. We did not declare a state of emergency. Um, this would not have done anything more than what we're doing right now. I think Anthony Haynes has been clear on this. Um, Mr. Panachetti has been clear on this. Everybody's been clear. We have done everything we can. <coughs> so, you know, it wouldn't have helped. All it would have done don't want to panic people. We are moving ahead in a positive direction. We see our numbers coming down dramatically. We're going to get through this. <laughs> Folks, I hate to say it, it's going to take a few more days. We're down to 32,000. You do the math, it's, 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 it's getting slower and slower. So, um, Metropolitan Union, Joe, you're going to update Great. We still want to feed our residents until that last uh, light comes on. Uh, we still want to address those issues. I just want to ask my residents, when it starts getting cold at night, that they leave those tap waters open because we don't want to have the fear of, of uh, bursting pipes. We had one last night. Uh, someone had opened up their window and uh, you know, froze the pipes and then burst again. So we want to make sure the residents understand leave those taps on because that keeps the flow of water and it won't uh, it'll prevent from those pipes being bursting. But that's been you know, good news. Uh, you know, at the height of this, we were 1,000 or 1,000 units. Now we're down to 76. And we're going to still be diligent and we're going to make sure that our residents are being addressed. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Toronto Fire Service is still very busy. Our call volumes in the last 24 hours are just over one and a half times the normal call volumes. Uh, a number of fire calls uh, related to the storm or indirectly related to the storm when people haven't had their furnaces on for uh, four and five days. Sometimes there's a extra energy required and the furnaces uh, sometimes are overworked. We've had a number of, of fires. We're still having a lot of carbon monoxide calls that we're responding to and that's one of the reasons for the high call volume. Uh, we did have a, a, a fire last night in a high rise. That was a, a working fire. Fortunately, it was on the main level. Crews got to it very quickly. It was on the Dixon Road and were able to uh, put the fire out very quickly. Several people were transported to the hospital with injury. Uh, again, still very busy, still very active. Uh, I still issue caution to people in their homes and to be very uh, cautious what they're using to light their homes, to heat their homes, and uh, be very cautious when power comes back to check all their appliances. And again, if in doubt, call 911 and we're there to respond. remain busy. Uh, however, uh, our volumes are coming down more towards uh, normal activity. We're, we continue to run today about 10% higher than normal. Um, the types of calls we're experiencing, we're not seeing the same number of slips, trips and falls and, and the um, types of calls related to the ice and the storm. We are seeing some calls related to uh, elderly or fragile 
population uh, having some stress on them, so uh, increase in uh, heart attacks, strokes, those types of things, diabetic emergencies. Um, our paramedics are doing a fantastic job out there. I'd like to take the opportunity to again thank our staff, our paramedics, dispatchers, support staff, and, and leadership team who have been working around the clock. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Are you seeing sort of decline in the blood Yeah, so very happy to report that we did not transport anyone last night um, who had CO, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning related to the emergency. Uh, we did transport seven patients with carbon monoxide, but that was related to a faulty furnace, not related to uh, barbecues or other things in people's homes. So the message that you've gotten out there around uh, that safety has been fantastic, and I encourage you to continue to um, get that message out there. Thank you. Chief Buckley, General Manager of Transportation. We currently have uh, 43 crews deployed today. Um, the streets have been fairly well cleaned up. The issue we have now is we're now cleaning up sidewalks. Um, over the past few days, we've been pushing most of the debris off the roadway onto the boulevard, uh, but there are still a lot of sidewalk blockages out there. So we have crews out there um, that are cleaning those up. There are still a lot of downed wires on sidewalks, so we are working with Toronto Hydro to identify locations. Uh, but the big thing we want to do is make sure people are safe. So we're attacking the arterial first and uh, providing a safe passage. One thing we are noticing, um, as people are cleaning up their private property, we ask that if you can place the debris in the boulevard or on your private property, we are seeing folks stack their debris on the sidewalk, and we know that for those uh, who have mobility issues, uh, this will become a problem over the next few days and weeks, so uh, please stack them again on private property or the boulevard. Any questions? We're also working closely with transportation, uh, again taking direction as Chief Buckley has just outlined so that we can get the streets opened up for TTC and, and uh, emergency vehicles. We've got uh, additional six crews coming in from Ottawa tomorrow. Uh, we've got another two from London. We're working on several more. We've got 16 more contractors coming in from out of province. Um, and uh, we should be expecting those crews to arrive in the next couple of days to help us out uh, with all the clearing up that needs to be done. Beyond that, we're asking people to uh, be safe out there. Remember the ice is still on the streets. It's dangerous. We know the kids want to go out and play in the snow. Uh, we need to keep them out from underneath the trees, please. Uh, that's very important. And uh, just keep aware of what's up there. There may still be broken branches that are up there that want to come down. And uh, we're looking to the warmer weather to hopefully release some of the pressure on the trees with the ice load coming off in the next couple of days. Thank you. Right now, what we need is buckets and cranes a lot specialized crews and uh, eventually when we get into the, the uh, clearing of brush, chipping that up and getting that into uh, tub grinders to grind it all up and move it away, that's where uh, we're, you know, we've got a whole debris management uh, program uh, being planned. So right now it's about getting the hazards looked after and getting the hydro and, and roads clear. Is there a reason why the Tree work can be very dangerous, especially now with the ice load on it. Tree branches are a lot heavier than they look. Um, we recommend uh, that you hire a professional arborist to look after your trees, do any pruning or tree removal that needs to be done. There are a lot of tree, uh, you know, arborists out there, and I guarantee you there will be uh, arborists from out of town moving into town to try and help out and try and get some of that business. And with the city as well, the city needs arborists? The city is also working with other cities as I outlined. We've got already six lined up from Ottawa and two from London. They're coming in tomorrow. Um, we've got uh, additional 16 contractors of our own that we're bringing in, and we're still working with several other. Uh, we're working with the Commercial Arborist Association, Landscape Ontario. We're working with uh, other cities as well. Can you speak to uh, how that works or how a homeowner can move forward if they have a city-owned tree on their property that they have to hire and pay for? An no, we're, the city's looking after the city trees, and the uh, homeowner only needs to call a private arborist for their own tree. Commitment to uh, my extended family at Christmas time, with my obligation to uh, the residents of Toronto. Uh, but I found uh, that um, there are times when uh, balance is impossible. 
And so to those people, to those residents of Toronto who have uh, been affronted by uh, my behavior, I want to convey to them a very sincere apology. Um, I've learned the lesson, uh, and I won't forget. Can you speak to uh, what took place in the meeting with Mr. Spear this morning? And, and what well, the, uh, the office of the deputy, <coughs> excuse me, the office of the deputy mayor uh, chairs uh, an emergency committee, uh, short form Kente, uh, and I thought that since we had done the vast bulk of the work, uh, restoring a lot of the power, most of the power, that it was time to sit down formally uh, and get an update um, to comment on <clears throat> what went right, some of the challenges that we faced, how we responded, uh, and second, and to make sure that we had uh, uh, we could review the uh, the number and caliber of the resources that were made available to our frontline people, and secondly, to uh, start looking forward to um, the uh, thirty thousand or so people that have to be connected in a slower fashion. You know, in, in the early days, once we got mobilized, we were doing about fifty thousand a day, and it looks as if going forward, um, we may be pressed to do ten thousand. I want, to, I want to take a look at that and as well look beyond to what I think will be a very formidable challenge of cleaning up the debris. So that was the reason for today's meeting. And I'm very uh, I'm pleased to say that, uh, that it was well attended uh, and people spoke to me uh, candidly uh, and with insights, and I appreciate that. Um, given, given your projections, uh, is it possible that this could carry into the new year? I mean, uh, Mr. Mayor, you also mentioned yourself that uh, this could be a few more days. It may, uh, it may depend on the complications that arise from a warming temperature and uh, higher winds. I know that at one point we were down to about 27,000 outages to be repaired, and that bounced back up to about 33. Uh, and we may see that over the next few days, uh, evaporating like this. But uh, we've, uh, we've got an unprecedented number of crews on the street, hydro, forestry. Um, and so we're, uh, people should know that we are doing our very, very best. Is there any rough estimate of the cost of the cleanup? Um, good question, uh, and one that has to be answered. One of the things uh, that I'm anticipating um, as chair of the executive committee is to strain this late plate on our 2014 budget. So that's a good question to be asked and it's one that has to be answered as quickly as possible. Will the funds for the cleanup come from a separate fund or where, where will the Well, it's my understanding that um, we do have a, an emergency reserve, but remember we had that flood back in July. <clears throat> I think a lot of that, that money was drained. And, uh, but I'll be talking to finance to see how we approach this. Mr. Kelly, when you were there, were you talking to the Minnesota I'm sorry? Were you talking yes. to the Minnesota Yes, Minnesota? I was. Okay. I was in touch with everybody. Uh, the Blackberry is a magic uh, instrument. So uh, I was in constant touch with the uh, senior staff, the premier. Uh, I answered all my emails, all the texts, and the relevant tweets. Okay. I took, in essence, I took my job with me. So again, I know you, you've touched on this already, but in terms of timeline, people could be leaning on the new year in the dark, even though there's some Christmas in the dark. Well, I don't want to scare them. But it's a possibility. But, um, it, everyone loves simplicity, but it's a, a complex and, in this instance, a laborious um, effort. I mean, I've learned more about hydro in the last three or four days than I ever thought I would have to know. Um, but I'm pleased to tell you that uh, through out all of this, that there's been a team of people uh, trying to guide the process, the mayor, myself as deputy mayor, uh, Councilor Benjamin, along as the chair of the works department, and members of council that are standing here. Um, this has been uh, teamwork on our side, uh, and we're hoping to bring it to a conclusion successfully earlier uh, than later. A question for the mayor. Has that lack of communication towards you, especially with the deputy mayor away for a short amount of time, and I appreciate he's addressed that, has that been frustrating? 
No, not at all. Um, my concern is to getting the power back on. Um, like I said, I've been here every day. Our crews behind us have been here every day. I want to thank them for their support, uh, especially Councilman Long and uh, John Levy. They haven't said much, but behind the scenes, they're, they're working very hard. I've talked to a number of councillors, and my job is to get the power back on for every resident, and I'll be holding press conferences every day until every single light's on in the city. Um, if there's no further questions, uh, our next press conference will be tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you.